Um, after this general picture, I think very, very good one, uh, I will go into one of the details of uh, TTIP, which is uh, ISDS, Investor to State Dispute Settlement. First, I will say why we in Institute of Global Responsibility in Poland, why we deal with it. Our work is focused on fighting causes um, of uh, injustices between North and South. And we know that the European investment policy is harming uh, developing countries very much. But now with TTIP, we're actually on the same side. We, I mean, uh, most of the people in the European Union and most of the people in the, in the Global South. <coughs> ISDS, uh, is an uh, uh, arm, I would say, uh, an arm of um, TTIP. Without, t without ISDS, uh, TTIP will, would be without uh, tooth. It is a way of how investors can uh, uh, actually influence the policies of so so sovereign states. First, how it started? It started in the late 1950s with a bilateral investment treaty between Germany and Pakistan. And for many, many years, it was not an important issue uh, in international economic relations. But with the decline of WTO, which was being described by, by my colleague, uh, the role of bilateral investment treaties is now increasing. Bilateral means between two parties. So it's fundamentally different to WTO, which is multilateral, which means it involves uh, many states at one time. Um, and uh, because we have almost 200 countries in, in, in the world now, the number of bilateral investment treaties uh, increased very sharply over the years. And, it, and it's now said that there, there are about 3,000 such a, a treaties uh, around the world. For example, Poland has more than 60 of such a treaties. Um, this, um, this picture shows a, a, a tendency of uh, how uh, bilateral investment treaties are being used to uh, enforce uh, investor rights or I would say privileges. This is a number of cases uh, which are being brought to uh, investor to state uh, dispute mechanism uh, and it's cumulative. So it, 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 sh it shows the overall fig figure uh, starting from 19. 1980s. As you see, there is a sharp increase of cases when an uh, investor sues a country. One very funny thing, I, I think, is that uh, when you see the, the word known ISDS cases here, why it, said, it is said known? because actually there is no one in this world who knows how many of these cases actually were. Because many of them are so uh, secret that general public never hears about them. And they are also secret to uh, international institutions. For example, to UNCTAD, as you see as a source of this, uh, uh, of this graph or to the European Union. When we had uh, con consultations of European Commission about ISDS in TTIP earlier this year, the Commission also used this term known cases. So it's even Commission does, that, that does not really know how many of them are there. I will talk later about the secrecy. So uh, who is actually being sued? As you see here, uh, 
if you combine developing and transition countries, and countries, it's it's already almost uh, three fourths. Uh, and this figure also includes countries like Poland and Czech Republic. By the way, both of our countries are among the most pursued by foreign investors in Europe. But as you see here, typical developing countries are also very harmed. And I will, see I will give you concrete examples of that. I would say for a country like Poland to lose, let's say, uh, 10 uh, billion uh, euros, it's a, it's a lot of money. But for a developing country, it's, it's much uh, more. And then who is using this mechanism? You see here the, the home states of, of uh, investors who sue countries. So uh, at the first uh, place you see the United States. Um, so I think we can expect that uh, US investors will be active also if TTIP will come into force. But also if you see then other countries, most of them come from Europe. So I would say it's a tool used by US or EU investors to sue countries. And as you seen it before, mostly developing countries or transition countries. And the whole uh, dispute in Europe, which comes out now, is because Western countries will, be, will become victims of the system uh, if the TIP comes in force. They never had it before. So how the system works? Uh, um, first of all, uh, the, uh, the investment treaty arbitration, it is based mostly on bilateral investment treaties. Not only, uh, there, is, there is, for example, uh, an energy charter treaty, uh, but in most cases, uh, bilateral investment treaties are being used. For example, a treaty between Czech Republic and United States, or Poland and France. Uh, but uh, there, are very, uh, there are a lot of things that you would not suspect could be in a system that is being called, that it is uh, uh, trying to bring justice. First of all, investors, they do not have to go first to domestic courts. So if uh, an investor in Czech Republic uh, feels that um, its um, profits are being jeopardized, it, it can go to a, a court, to a private court, uh, without uh, using the same uh, justice system that every Czech company would use if their uh, rights would be broken. So in this way, uh, in, foreign investors have better rights than domestic investors, because domestic investors cannot go to these courts. It's only for foreign investors in every country. Then, uh, uh, it's only investors that can sue States cannot sue the investor in this mechanism. So it means it's only one way. We In Poland we say it's a, a football game to, to one goal only. Is it understandable? So, uh, so really uh, the, 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 the country can only defend itself. Uh, what could be the reasons for being sued by an investor for a country? So things like uh, uh, unfair or um, inequitable treatment, discriminatory treatment, which is against natu national treatment, because investment, bilateral investment treaties say uh, foreign investors should be treated no less favorably than domestic investors. Please note, no less favorably means not equally. It can be not, uh, not less favorable, but it could be better. And actually, in many cases, it is. Foreign investors get, get some uh, rights that domestic investors don't. 
Uh, then uh, the thing called expropriation, and you have direct and indirect expropriation, and this is something which is very extensively used for all kinds of um, state behavior um, as a pretext, I would say, uh, to get some compensation. It's not about that, that the state confiscates the company, so it's unfair treatment. It's also about uh, changing environmental rules which uh, set higher standards, for example, for water, uh, um, uh, wa uh, how water is clean. Uh, and if the state raises the standards, the um, investor can say it has been expropriated because uh, the, uh, the business is no more profitable. And that's actually behind one of the cases of Vattenfall against Germany. Uh, and then performance requirements, which are generally, uh, for example, rules of how many uh, items could be produced in a country if a state tries to uh, have its own policy uh, and it uh, gives some requirements on performance. For example, if a country would like to limit the number of cars used in a country or things like, or, or um, uh, natural resources used, it is a performance requirement. <coughs> then uh, you have the uh, arbitrators. Uh, and uh, the reason for, uh, for a, a case in ISDS can be any uh, decision made by state which is legislative, executive or judicial. In other words, everything what your parliament does, everything what the government does, or the court, even the highest court, this can be reason for being sued in investor to slave dispute settlement. For example, if a country introduces a law that gives a minimum wage, it's uh, it's something that that uh, that is actually in one case a reason uh, for country to be sued. For example, if you would change Czech constitution because of some reason and an investor would feel that it breaks his uh, rights, limits his profits, it might be a reason for ISDS. So it's anything the state does, and the state is made by every uh, body of the state. So both the highest court, the parliament, the president, um, um, uh, government, lo local governments, for example, Canada was sued uh, because of, 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 of what local government uh, decided. So anything what the, what the, what the, what the state does. Then uh, the monetary compensation for, for the investor uh, can be unlimited. There, there are no, uh, uh, no limits on that and uh, the amount is being decided by the private tribunal. And in some cases, for example, uh, the, the, one of the uh, well-known, the Vattenfall case, the uh, amount of money is 4.7 billion euros. And then, what is really uh, uh, surprising is that the, these private courts uh, can decide on their own jurisdiction. Because bilateral investment treaties, they do not really uh, uh, detail all things related to disputes. And there are some areas that can be inter interpreted in, in many ways. And, and, uh, uh, um, uh, and the judges in these tribunals, they uh, can decide if it's their competence or not. Of course, it is very much different to regular judicial system. Then, uh, what is also very important, also in the context of TTAP, is that these uh, uh, awards are very strongly enforceable. 
uh, there is the New York Convention on Execution of uh, uh, um, International Treaties, uh, which regulates that. And so, if a state is being, uh, uh, if, if there is a award by the private tribunal, that state has to pay, let's say, 3 billion euros, there is practic practically no way to avoid that. And the reason is that uh, if, if the state is a party to this New York Convention, and 150, more than 150 states are part, then an uh, investor can uh, get any asset of the state in any country of the world. A few months ago, you heard about uh, Argentinian sheep, which was uh, seized in Ghana, because uh, uh, because uh, the investor wanted his his money that he was awarded uh, by the private tribunal. There are some exceptions. For example, embassies cannot be um, uh, seized. But all other things, and our countries have lots of uh, things outside of the, our borders. For example, ships. Uh, this can be uh, enforced uh, uh, as a part of the compensation. So generally, there is no way, even for countries who are very vocal and powerful, like Argentina or Venezuela or Bolivia, that are really fighting ISDS, uh, they find very few ways to avoid pain if they are being, uh, um, if they have to. Then, uh, well, that would be a solution. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so now, how does it, the, the system work? So, uh, there is not a, a one court, a, a physical building where these cases are being uh, discussed. Uh, instead, you have rules and institutions that are administrating cases. And uh, actually, two of the most well-known and most frequently used are ICSID, which stands for International Center for Settlement and Investment Disputes. And this is actually part of World Bank. And then you have UNCITRAL, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. But also you have uh, um, several other uh, um, institutions and sets of rules that could be used. For example, International Chamber of Commerce or um, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And the, 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 um, the cases, they do not happen in the buildings of that institution. They can, they can happen everywhere. Because it's a private system. It's a private system of justice for investors. Uh, so uh, if, if, if someone says uh, there is an it's it case, it does not mean it is being discussed in New York, in, in World Bank, but it can be discussed, for example, in uh, held else, for example, in London or Paris. But uh, these rules, they set um, a general framework of how the system works. Because as you see, there are so many, there are several rules, and actually also some other business uh, um, uh, chambers of commerce could uh, host such uh, cases. For example, in Poland we have Polish Chamber of Commerce, and a case could be held also there, if bilateral investment treaty allows that. How does it work? Step by step. Uh, first, the investor uh, informs the, the country that uh, it, w it wants a compensation. Recently in Poland, a month ago, we had information that another investor wants 100 million euros. Secondly, investor and state jointly select arbitration tribunal. And this comes from private lawyers who are experts in international arbitration and investment law. And in, in many cases, in most cases, there, there are three persons on, on that tribunal. One is being chosen by an investor. Uh, 
the climate, so-called climate, uh, second one by a, a, a state, and then the third one should uh, be agreed uh, by them both. Then um, uh, there are several years before the, the case is being concluded. The, um, uh, they are secret. For example, th there are some Polish uh, uh, civil rights organizations who fight for access to public information, and they go into court with Polish, uh, one of the Polish institutions that is responsible for this. And uh, Polish ministry uh, gives as little information as, as it could. Why? Two reasons. One is that it is explicitly written in bilateral investment treaties that information can be uh, published only in, if both sides agree on that. And if one side does not, it has to remain secret. Uh, then, uh, after several years, uh, you, um, you get a, a so-called award. How this award looks like, you can see here, that's one of the pages. What was, uh, this is a case, Servier, a French pharmaceutical company against Poland. Uh, it sued Poland for, as far as, far as, far as, far as I remember, 150 million dollars. Um, and this is what, uh, what, uh, what is being accessible. Most of the most interesting parts are being, as you see, wiped out. Um, uh, so, uh, no one really knows which uh, case really concluded. With some exceptions, when one of the parties really wants to make it public. For example, government of Ecuador is fighting oil companies, and it's and it's and it's going very public about it. But most of the countries, including Poland, uh, is really secret. And then the last uh, point, the last phase: state has to comply with the arbitral award. If if they resist, the award can be enforced almost everywhere in the world. For example, by seizing state's property. So once the private tribunal gave the verdict, you have to do it. Uh, what's the problem with, with, with these tribunals? First, about the arbitral, arbitrators themselves. They uh, have various roles, because they are lawyers. Sometimes they are judges, sometimes they represent one of the sides. And in fact, in Polish cases, uh, we had uh, law companies which in one case were defending Poland uh, from the investor, and in other were, were hired by uh, investor to sue Poland. Of course, you can imagine how much information they have about internal things that, of the state that could be used in their favor. Sometimes um, uh, a, a lawyer who is uh, representing an uh, investor uh, uses the argumentation saying that in this case the judgment was this and this. And the funny thing is that he was the judge who, who made that uh, case. So you don't have a very simple and very uh, obvious division of roles between judges and, uh, and professional uh, lawyers. Then uh, the judges, uh, they have financial interest in making the market bigger. The more cases there are, the bigger claims are, the more money they get and their typical uh, remuneration is uh, up to $1,000 per, per hour. Uh, and of course, uh, they are interested in promoting ISDS. And the, 
I will give you an example. There is a new organization which is called EFILA, E F I L A dot org. If you go to that website, you will find uh, many law firms that say in ISDS has to be defended and they are going to promote it. And among uh, partners of that, you don't have only law firms that profit from this system, but also, regrettably, also one of the uh, civil servants, actually the main experts on ISDS in Polish government. So um, there is there is big concentration of power of power among uh, arbitrators. Actually, there is a very small group of uh, judges that are involved in most of the cases. For example, t only 12 arbitrators were present in uh, on 60 percent of uh, of um, uh, exit uh, cases. Uh, you can find similar numbers. Uh, showing that there are about 15 up to 20, 25 arbitrators, uh, arbitrators who actually are involved in most of the cases all over the world. And this is a graphical example of that. It's, uh, I took it from the report of Corporate Europe Observatory and Transna Transnational Institute. It shows in names of uh, specific uh, arbitrators and uh, uh, it shows in how many cases they were together with some other arbitrators. So if you heard about 300 cases, it is actually being decided by this very small group of, of lawyers. Then what's wrong about um, investor privileges? Uh, in the ISDS. First of all, I, I, already, I already told you that uh, the investor does not have to um, uh, go through a normal domestic court system. But investor actually can uh, sue country parallelly in different courts by different rules. And it happened also to Poland. Sometimes, so, for example, it goes to ICSID and it goes to UNCITRO. And it happens sometimes that one um, uh, tribunal says that uh, the state uh, did not break uh, in, in investment protection at, and it does not have to pay anything. And the other tribunal says the state has to pay the compensation. About exactly the same thing. Then there is a treaty shopping. If you have a multi, uh, multinational corporation and you work in many countries at one, side, one time, you can use one of your uh, subsidiaries uh, for the purpose of the case, ISDS case. For example, if there is a corporation which works both in uh, United States and France, and it uh, believes it, it lost some profits because of what Polish government did, it can choose. Will it use Polish-French bilateral investment treaty or Polish-US bilateral treaty? Or one of many others that they, uh, that they have. And then only investor can win. You, you hear sometimes that, sometimes that in 40% of cases, states uh, wins, in about 30% uh, it's investor who wins, and in more or less 30% uh, there is a, a settlement. So uh, the case finishes before the, um, the tribunal gives us a word. But uh, first of all, what does it mean um, the, the um, state won? It means it did, does not have to pay a compensation, but still it has to pay, for example, legal fees. What does it mean there is a settlement? That it means that uh, the representatives of state and representatives of investor 
somehow found, found an agreement that is suitable for, for both of them. So for example, in Poland, we had a case of 31 billion uh, euros, uh, and it was settled. We have no idea, actually, how much Polish government actually paid. I can imagine it was probably not more than half of that, but still, it's billions. So if you hear only 40% cases are being uh, um, uh, won by investor, we can say it in all the other way around. Uh, in 60% cases, the state loses somehow. Um, then, um, uh, what are the options to, to reform it, if one would like to? Well, first of all, is to bring uh, justice. Some rules that are being used in a uh, um, real judicial system. For example, secure tenure, tenure or remuneration for judges. Now, the lawyers who sit on, on panels, arbitrator panels, they earn more if they take more cases and more uh, which, which are, as the claims are, are bigger. Of course, they are interested in, in uh, pursuing that. There should be an objective assessment of cases, uh, not by people who actually profit from, uh, uh, from, um, from this. And of course, uh, conflicts of interest should be reviewed in an independent manner exactly the same as it is in normal courts that you have in Czech Republic, we have in Poland, etc. Then, um, what, what could be um, a solution for investor protection? Well, uh, I would say it is somehow uh, desirable that investors are protected uh, from the most harsh um, uh, actions by the state. There must be some way of, of, of ensuring that, uh, for example, uh, um, um, factories are not co uh, confiscated uh, without any compensation. But you have much more uh, options than only this ISDS. And I will focus on only one on this, which is, I think, the best. That's the in International Investor State Court, a permanent court that would uh, have all the um, rules of judicial system, and of course that would save that would have safeguard that 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 the system could not be abused. There are some claims, uh, that, um, some costs of that. Uh, uh, let's see. Average claim is uh, almost 500 million US dollars, uh, but average award is much less. It's um, 76 uh, uh, million dollars. Then uh, some uh, significant uh, cases. For example, Ecuador um, um, has to have, have to pay uh, 2.73 billion uh, dollars. And if you would make this this kind of uh, exercise and adjust its GDP. Uh, to um, to United Kingdom GDP, that would mean that as if UK would have to pay 70 billion uh, dollars. Or if you ad would adjust this to GDP of United States, that would be as if uh, the award would be half half of a trillion. So it's a lot of money for a small and poor country like Ecuador. Uh, I could not uh, erase it here. That the Czech Republic case, probably uh, you all know, you all know it. Uh, did you hear about louder tax? Maybe we can uh, talk about it later. And there is a case from Democratic Republic of Congo, which is only nine million. It's not a lot of money, nine million dollars. But on the other hand, it was two percent of the total government expenditure. Uh, of that year, you know, so really uh, a big blow to the public uh, budget. Uh, another example from developing countries, El Salvador, El Salvador that uh, is being sued for 
300 million uh, dollars because it's decision to ban uh, open pit mining because of uh, environmental and human concerns. Again, it's a lot of money for, for such a small country. Um, that's about the cost. Maybe what's important, the typical, um, uh, the typical uh, case uh, fees are about eight million uh, dollars, I think. Uh, but there are some significant costs uh, if a country is being sued very often. Uh, and you see examples here, like in case of Argentina, uh, 12 million dollars, or a very interesting uh, case of Ecuador, which is being sued very often recently. It has spent almost 100 million dollars only on legal fees. So it's not the compensation for investors. It's only legal fees, costs of, of, of law firms and, and tribunals. Um, how our costs are um, shared, that's not really important. Something here important. Uh, open letter from um, 223 civil society organizations from Burma, Myanmar, because EU is now uh, negotiating its bilateral investment treaty with uh, Burma. And so many organizations there, uh, they are uh, really against ISDS uh, because they, well, for so many reasons, and they listed here what are the reasons. Then, uh, if we talk about TTIP, let's not forget about regulatory cooperation. Some people say it's even worse than ISDS. Because it's, it actually makes uh, TTIP negotiations eternal. <coughs> regulatory cooperation is basically a mechanism that is being planned for a body that will assess the impact of trade of any European regulation. Before elected bodies de uh, decide on that or discuss it. So for example, if there are uh, some uh, projects of improving environmental standards or uh, maybe GMOs, first, the, the group of people, the regulatory council, would discuss, is it good for EU-US trade? Before it's being discussed, for example, in European Parliament. And this would be permanent. So, regardless of what will be in TTIP and what not, we'll have eternal body which will uh, actually be first before even our elected uh, representatives. And then um, uh, I would not, I will finish here, but just for those of you who does, do not know it, Czech Republic is the third country in the world, most sued in the world, with 27 cases against the Czech Republic. I'm really curious if you know about this louder attacks. Uh, then uh, you see Poland, there are 16 cases, known cases. Actually, I, for, uh, for several months I made an investigation and research, and actually I found uh, nine new cases against Poland. So actually, I think there are 25 against Poland. We'll publish a report uh, on, on Poland and ISDS soon. Then, uh, yeah that's, yeah, that's economics, maybe, you know, who will benefit? But then, just la la last slide, uh, I, um, there is a grow, growing knowledge about it in Poland. Um, in, in September, we organized a joint statement of Polish NGOs, and now we have 47 Polish NGOs and NGO coalition which uh, made a statement on dangers of, uh, of TTIP, of course, including secrecy of negotiations and including ISDS 
and we are really against it. And we hope to reach 100 in a few months. And to make pressure on our politicians, which are otherwise very pro-free trade. Thank you.